is that if you're going to just assume everything started out uniform, then you don't need inflation. Uh, but if you want to have an explanation for how things got to be uniform, uh, inflation does that for you beautifully, and we don't really know anything else that does. Okay, second item I want to talk about is what's called the flatness problem. Uh, why was the early universe especially so flat? The universe today is apparently quite flat, too, but the early universe was amazingly flat. Uh, and uh, we'd like to understand why. Now, by flat, uh, I do want to make it clear that I'm not talking about two-dimensional flat, not flat like a piece of paper. Uh, by flat, what I mean is Euclidean. Uh, as you probably know, in the context of general relativity, uh, Euclidean geometry does not have to work. Uh, generically, Euclidean geometry does not work in general relativity. Uh, and in particular, uh, if we're talking about uh, universes, uh, universes are assumed to be, on the large scales, uh, homogeneous, the same in all places, and also isotropic, the same in all directions. And if you make those assumptions, there are actually only three kinds of universes that are allowed. Uh, closed universes, open universes, and flat universes. And they're pictured here as two-dimensional slices. Uh, the reason for that is just that you can visualize a two-dimensional curve space. Uh, people are not capable of visualizing a three-dimensional curved space. Even physicists are not capable of visualizing a three-dimensional curved space. So when we think about curved space, we make analogies in, uh, for two-dimensional curved spaces. Uh, now, uh, a geometrical point which you can make, which you, you can calculate, it really does carry through to the three-dimensional geometry as well. Uh, if you have a closed geometry and draw a triangle on it, uh, the sum of the three angles is a little bit more than what you get in Euclidean geometry, a little bit more than 180 degrees, as you can hopefully visualize from that diagram. The diagram really is drawn draw to scale. It's really our straight lines drawn on the surface of the sphere, the great circle lines. Uh, if the space is saddle-shaped, then the corners get pinched, uh, and the sum of the three angles is less than 180 degrees. Mm. And if you're on a plane, the sum of the three angles of a triangle is exactly 180 degrees, as we all learned in high school. Uh, so these are the three kinds of possible geometries. Uh, and what we're saying is that the early universe was incredibly close to this flat geometry. And even today it's close, but not incredibly close. At least, well, at least we don't know it to be incredibly close, I should say. We don't really know what it is today. Uh, now, according to general relativity, uh, this curvature uh, is related to the mass density. Uh, because in general relativity, it's the mass density that causes space to bend. Uh, so the amount of mass determines what kind of curvature the space has. Uh, and for any given expansion rate, there's a, a magic number called the critical mass density. It depends on the expansion rate. Uh, and that's the mass density that is just right to make the universe geometrically flat. Uh, and cosmologists talk about this ratio of the actual mass density to this calculated critical mass density. Uh, and that ratio is called omega, the Greek letter capital omega. Uh, and the way it's defined, it means that if omega is equal to 1, these two numbers are equal, and the geometry is flat. If omega is bigger than 1, uh, the universe is closed. And if omega is less than 1, the universe is open, like the saddle shape here. Uh, now, the key point uh, is that as the universe evolves during its early period, uh, the behavior of this number omega, this ratio of the actual mass density to the critical density, uh, acts a lot like a pencil bouncing on its tip. So I spent some time figuring out how to do a good drawing of pencils bouncing on their tips. Uh, I did this for the book that I wrote. Um, so uh, what it means is that uh, it's an unstable equilibrium. And by unstable equilibrium, what we mean is it's an equilibrium in the sense that if the pencil is exactly straight up, it won't know which way to fall, and in principle it will stay standing exactly straight up forever, uh, at least as far as classical physics is concerned. If you put in quantum mechanics, it's not true anymore, but we'll, we'll talk about classical pencils as our analogy. Uh, but if this classical pencil leans just a little bit in any direction, it will rapidly start to fall in that direction. And that's the same as the way omega behaves in the early universe. Uh, so if omega in the early universe, this ratio of mass densities, if it was slightly below one, uh, it would rapidly fall to zero. Uh, and that means that no galaxies would ever form. The universe would just thin out to negligible mass density uh, immediately. On the other hand, if omega was slightly greater than one, it would rapidly rise towards infinity, which means that the universe would turn around and recollapse. Uh, that would be a closed universe. Uh, it would recollapse very quickly if omega was more than just a tiny, tiny bit bigger than one. So if you put in numbers, uh, to be as close uh, 
to the critical density as we measure today, if you extrapolate back to say one second after the Big Bang, and let me add here a parenthetical note, uh, that one second sounds pretty extraordinary when you talk about the lifetime of the universe, uh, but that actually is the time when these processes of nucleosynthesis that made the light chemical elements were beginning. So we really think that we have at least one significant cosmological success which suggests that we really do understand the universe at least back to one second. Uh, and if we extrapolate that far uh, and ask uh, how close uh, to the critical density of the universe must have been then to be where we are now, it's like looking after 10 billion years and saying the pencil still looks like it's almost straight up. How close did it have to be at the very beginning? Incredibly close. Uh, and numerically, it's, it's one part in 10 to the 15, to 15 decimal places. Uh, so the claims that to be consistent with the universe we now see, uh, omega at one second after the Big Bang must have been equal to one to an accuracy of 15 decimal places. Uh, now, I like to say that that makes the value of the mass density of the universe at one second after the Big Bang probably the most precisely known number in physics, even though it sounds so remote. And I really think it is reliable. Uh, is that miracle number three? What? Could is it miracle, miracle number, number three? three? No, because we're going to explain this one. <laughs> well, you might want to count this. I guess the other miracles are explainable, too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll do that next time. Uh, yeah? Um, does Weinberg's first three-minute model still hold up with today's content? Yeah, it holds up beautifully. It really does. Weinberg was very smart when he wrote that book. Uh, and there were you know, a lot of wrong ideas around then and some right ideas, and he managed to do an excellent job of choosing which were the ones to talk about. So as far as I know, literally everything in the book is right with the, I guess there's one minor change, which I, is very minor. Uh, since the book was discovered, we discovered there's one more kind of neutrino than Weinberg knew about when he wrote the book back in 1979. Uh, and extra neutrinos do actually affect the details of how the early universe evolves. So most of the numbers get changed by a little bit by the effect of that extra neutrino. Uh, but the, all the ideas still stay the same, really, is what Weinberg discussed. It's rather amazing, I think. Uh, okay, so I was about to explain how inflation uh, solved this problem of, of the flatness of the universe. Why was the mass density of the universe so incredibly close uh, to this special value, the critical value? I should maybe preface this first by emphasizing that in conventional cosmology, uh, there's just no explanation for what the initial mass density of the universe was. In conventional cosmology, these initial conditions were just made up. Uh, you're free to make, uh, make them up and, and, and make up a model in which the universe started out being exactly equal to the critical mass density, uh, but there's really nothing whatever in the theory to suggest that that should be the answer. Uh, so it just had to be something that was put in out of whole cloth. Uh, inflation, on the other hand, can really explain why uh, the universe started out with an omega so incredibly close to 1. Uh, and the reason is that inflation itself drives omega towards 1. Uh, during inflation, I always told you that gravity acts repulsively, uh, and that changes everything about what gravity does, as you might guess. Uh, and in particular, it changes the way that <laughs> omega evolves, uh, so that during the inflationary period, Omega is not driven away from one, like the pencil on its tip, uh, but in fact is driven towards one, and it, it's driven towards one incredibly rapidly. Uh, so that if one had is the amount of inflation that we already talked about, uh, it means that Omega did not have to start out being equal to one to an accuracy of 15 decimal places. It could have started out being 1.5 or 10 or a tenth. Uh, the further away it starts, you have to have a little bit of extra inflation to bring it back to one. But that's all. You only, you only need very little extra inflation uh, for reasonable uh, deviations from one from where Omega might have started. Uh, so inflation gives a very natural explanation uh, for why, when inflation was done, uh, Omega was extraordinarily close to one, uh, which is consistent with what we observe. Um, so this actually leads to a prediction. Uh, since the mechanism that inflation has to drive the universe to Omega equals one, is so powerful, you could arrange things so that it just stops after it does the minimal job. But that requires very uh, precise fine-tuning, because it's all happening so extraordinarily fast. Uh, so unless you time it exactly right and say, now yeah, let's stop inflating, uh, the inflation will always overshoot and produce a universe that's much flatter uh, than you needed it to be to be consistent with current observations. And that, therefore, makes a prediction for future observations. Uh, so the, what the prediction is, is that the universe really should be fl as flat as flat can be. 